Well, on this halftime weekend, you know, we as a church, you all know that we love to do church as a team, and we love to give honor where honor is due. So right now, we want to honor one of our quarterbacks. He was our original campaign director that helped us launch this whole future and a whole building initiative. Let's uh, call up Tom Grubb. Let's thank Tom. Come on, Tom. You know, I remember that you're capable of all things, Tom. Come on, you and I try. Come on, Tom. Sean couldn't go. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Retired. <laughs> but, you know, we do want to honor Tom because here, uh, Tom, as many of you don't know, he's retired. But before he retired, he worked for the United States State Department. He went all over the world finding all of the properties for our embassies and actually helping build all the embassies. Then he came in, retired, jumped in to serving as a volunteer and doing that great job. Here's the favor that is on him. So to do the building initiative, right, we needed the Malka Annex, the warehouse. But the owner and people said they would never lease it. It was not supposed to be leased. It wasn't available. We said, Tom, go get the warehouse. He prayed, went, and he got it. And then we need, yeah. <laughs> We needed more parking, so at the end of the road, the Pakai Salt Lot, a couple years ago, we went and we said, hey, can we rent it? Can we lease it? That would, and they said, sorry, no, don't, no, sorry. I said, Tom, go get that lot. He went, prayed about it. He got the pa Pakai Salt Lot. <laughs> and then we said, hey, Tom, can you help us launch this building campaign? And he did, and he did a very excellent job. Remember, in that initial uh, last ha first half of the year, last year, then if you remember, we had all the gatherings, the informational meetings and dinners. I took over that part. And then when we made our pledges, Pastor Cindy Burgess now is doing all the follow through That is doing building fun as a campaign. Amen? But uh, again, we just wanted to honor you and thank you here at this halftime. And one thing that stood out over the whole time is you always, you've talked about the three T's. And I think that's just amazing because really I'm going to use it in the future. Okay, <laughs> but can you share with them about the three T's? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and any uh, honor or whatever that Pastor John had just passed to me, I want to reflect to God because he has opened those doors. Amen. It's not me, it's God working through me, and I'm uh, blessed for that, overwhelmingly blessed to be able to serve the Lord. The three T's are time, talent, and treasure. My time, I'm more than happy to uh, give to the team in whatever way we can. We do church as a team here, you know, and uh, the time. And then the talent, the Lord has blessed me with a lot of experience that many people never have a chance to do, and I'm blessed for that. But then I could bring that here to help organize the team and uh, for the campaign, and that was a blessing in its own right. But treasure... Treasure is another thing that is just, it's such a blessing to be able to give uh, from wherever you are, whether it's a small amount or a large amount. So Pam and I prayed about it, and we put in our pledge card, and then the Lord began to lead us to give more. And I then, like that. <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese boy over here. So, but... Uh, then it continued. The Lord said, give more and give more. And so we, in obedience to him and in return for all the glory, all that he's done for us, uh, we continued giving uh, from our hearts. And through that process, we agreed together as a husband and wife that what better way to invest or give your money, your treasure, to a facility that's going to pr promote the true and saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so we're blessed with the privilege of having done that. Amen. Thank you so much, Tom. Give him a hand. No, we're not going to try the touchdown thing again. <laughs> hey, everybody, our coach is back. Our coach, Jeff Shortridge, as you remember, for those of you who are new, he's from Enjoy Stewardship. It's a John Maxwell organization and over the past two years, he's been the one that actually has put together the whole strategy and has been guiding us and coaching us. And today you get to hear him. He's been here before. Now I'm going to test you, okay? 
Whenever Jeff Shortridge, Pastor Jeff Shortridge, gets excited and he wants to affirm things for Jesus Christ and he gets into the message, what does he say? You remember. <laughs> well, let's welcome Pastor Jeff Shortridge. together and give God a crazy praise in this house today because you know you love him you know he's been good to you right yay God you may be seated God bless you wow the house is full today and every time I see you you just look better and better and I see more new faces each time and uh, for those of you in the balcony i'm sorry we don't have any seats any farther back for you but god bless you and i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> um no we're just happy to see everybody where's the texas folk i i, I'm, I saw some texas folk earlier Where, there you are is that you yeah give it up for texas back here and uh how many of you are visiting from out of town let me see your hand you're visiting from out out of island is that how you say it around here <laughs> Well, good to, good to see each of you. God bless you. I'm visiting from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, just happy to be in the house of the Lord. I started coming here uh, in 2015, and I've literally uh, lost track of how many times uh, I've been here. But uh, what started out is just relationships with people turned into deep friendships with your pastors and staff members and, and Pastor Wayne and Pastor John Burgess and Pastor John Tilton and just so grateful for each one that's here and the prayer team god bless you thank you for being here and ross and 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 stephanie and each uh, mary god bless you good aaron god bless you it's so good to see you uh aaron cordell with us today and i'm just grateful to see you again he's in uh, such a blessing to the house and uh for those of you who know him if you don't know him you're probably not even a member here what in the world's wrong with you get down here and meet this man and uh, Tom and Pam, just incredible spirit and gift of hospitality. So glad uh, to be with them and Pastor Annie and, and her just down here with a headset, making sure everything's working fine and coming together. And it's just good to be in the house of the Lord. Can you say glory? glory. <laughs> um, let me do just a quick survey. Let me ask you a question. Um, and, and what I want to do is I want to switch to something, just go to a spiritual note real fast and talk about you personally and your personal life. And I, I just want you to look inward for a second as I ask you this question. Has, has anyone in this room, with the show of hands, have you ever been given a word from God in your life? You felt God gave you a word for something in your life. If that's you, lift your hand. I saw hands going up already. My goodness, look at this. Hands all in the balcony, on the floor. And, for some of you, it may have just been a scripture that you were reading, and the scripture leapt off the pages. We call that a rhema word. When a scripture comes alive to you, and you're like, wow, I, I read that a hundred times. I never saw it like that. But man, God gave it to you as your word. Maybe it was a prophetic word that somebody literally prophesied over you. But there are word, there's a word over everyone uh, in, this, in this house. Some of you didn't raise your hand just now, and I just want to remind you of a prophetic word that has been spoken over you for over a year now. In fact, it was where future and hope was derived from. Jeremiah chapter 29, I'd like for us to read this together because this is your personal word from this day forward. Look at the screens, if you will. Ready, read. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That is your word from God where he promises you that his plan is to make sure that you do not get harmed through this journey called life. To make sure that you have a beautiful future and that it is a hope-filled future. But I need to explain something to you. Sometimes, if you're filling out the, the blanks in your paper, sometimes God's promises don't come to pass overnight. Somebody say, I know, what I, I know what you're talking about. 
Sometimes when God gives you a word, it takes time to actually see it come to fruition. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the objective of the enemy is very clear because there's a time frame between when God gives you a word and gives you a promise and when it actually comes to pass. And in that time frame, it is the objective and the duty of the enemy of your soul to convince you that God is reneging on his promises. It is Satan's job to convince you that you serve a God that is a bait and switch God. That he will bait you with all the promises from Genesis to Revelation. And then when you turn your life over to him and say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Then suddenly God conveniently forgets about you and goes on running the universe. While your life falls apart at the seams. Yeah. But I've come all the way from the mainland to tell somebody that that word that God has spoken over your life, that word that you know in your heart of hearts is from God, it's for you, that God has not forgotten you. You're in the between time. You're at a place that's just kind of halfway between when the word was spoken and when the word will be fulfilled. The question is not will God fulfill it, it is when will he fulfill it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm reminded of, a, of a, if, if you've read the Old Testament, you know the story of, a young boy, his name was David, and he was a shepherd boy, but he was also a musician and a songwriter, and uh, he was a vocalist. He was extremely talented, and he was out in the field one day, tending to his sheep and playing and singing, and, and lo and behold, he looked up over the crest of the hill, and here comes the prophet Samuel, and in tow was his dad and his brothers, and he's like, what, what in the world is going on? It's not my birthday. What in the world? Why are they showing? And the prophet made his way over to him across the grassy green. And he said, boy, take a knee. The Lord has called you. And David knelt down because when the man of God says, kneel, you kneel. David knelt down and the man of God poured out a horn of oil. And the prophet Samuel poured it over his head. And he said, God has anointed you to be the next king over Israel. Now, that may sound like a cool Bible story, but let me translate that into today's language. That would be like... Pastor John Burgess showing up at your front door one morning and saying, take a knee, the Lord has called you, and pouring out a, pulling out a bottle of Crisco oil and pouring it over your head. <laughs> That'll teach you to not smoke right there, right? I'm telling you. <laughs> and saying, and this is what he would say to you, the Lord has called you to be the next president of the United States. Now, if I were you, I'd go to bed with fear and trembling that night. And I'd be looking out my window thinking the CIA was going to show up and cart me off in a black limo. And maybe David went to bed thinking, you know, are the horses and chariots going to show up? Is somebody going to bump off King Saul tonight and, and just pave the way? And, and they're going to come and get me at the house when they hear what the man of God did? Sometimes it doesn't happen that easy. That would have been nice if somebody would have just bumped off King Saul that night and then the word had been spread that the next king had already been anointed and up David goes. But David wasn't ready because the anointing on him was so demanding. The call and the gift on him was so huge that who he was, he was not able to sustain and to carry that calling and that anointing. There had to be a lot of work done on him and it was going to take some time and it was going to take some trial and some testing. See, there comes a point in everyone's life that you come to a crossroads if you're filling out your papers. Somewhere halfway to your promise that you come to a place where you're not sure if you're actually walking out your promise or if your promise is not going to be fulfilled. So here's David. He wakes up the next morning. You can fill in your blanks while I'm talking. He wakes up the next morning. No chariot. No caravan, no buglers, nobody taken into the throne room. In fact, it doesn't take you long. You, you read much farther and you'll find out that Saul found out David was anointed to be king, got mad about it, took a whole army of guys with him and started chasing David, trying to literally kill him. So here's David running, knowing he's that the king himself is trying to assassinate him. He's hiding, running from village to village, mountain to mountain, hiding during the day, running during the night. And a group of men gather around him that they're running for their lives too. And they're in trouble with the law. They've done all kinds of things that, that just 
that got them in trouble. And the Bible says they were in debt and distressed and discontented. And, and I mean, these were guys that had a rap sheet. They had been incarcerated. They had stole. They had, they had killed people. They had, they had evaded taxes, hadn't paid their tithes, all kinds of crazy stuff. They hadn't been doing it. They were all gathered around. Well, that was thick right there. I'm just going to go right on by that. So they, they just, all, I was kidding, okay? So they're all gathered around David. And finally, they, they come into a town called Abdullam. And Adullam had a, a network of caves in it. And David and his men ran into these caves and they found peace and safety for the first time in a long time. The caves were cool and it blocked the heat of the blazing sun and, and they were able to relax and David could sleep without worrying about an arrow coming down out of the sky and piercing him. And, 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 and he thought, you know, David could have painted the walls and moved in furniture, hung pictures on the cave walls because they finally found a place of peace and comfort where he could just kind of settle down. But David remembered that there was an anointing on him, that there was a word of God that had been spoken over him. He was anointed to be the king over Israel, and he realized he knew that kings don't live in caves. Yeah. Kings live in what? Palaces. In palaces. Cavemen live in caves. But kings live in palaces, and because David remembered the words spoken over him, he refused to settle at that halfway place between when he was called, when he got a word, and when that word came to fruition. And David got up and he kept fighting because the two choices you just filled out on your card is what? Settle or what? <laughs> David refused to settle. He chose to finish the course. There are those of you in this room today that you are at a place in your life personally. You're at a crossroads. Many of you raised your hand. You're at a place where God has spoken something over you. I don't know if it's educational. I don't know if it's financial. I don't know if it's occupational. There are visions and dreams that God has placed in you and the enemy has been pushing you back and you have felt like you have gone everywhere except where you're supposed to go. Things didn't change for you when you got that word. When God spoke to you and put that in your heart, you didn't wake up the next morning and things were changed. Everything looked the same. See, for David, nothing changed physically. In fact, it went downhill. But spiritually, everything changed because everything that happens in the natural is a reflection of what first takes place in the supernatural. And when David had that word over him, it painted a bullseye on him and the enemy of his soul began to target him and... See, the enemy of your soul has been targeting some of you in this house, knowing that there's a great thing and a great calling over your life. And during that time frame between when you receive the word and when it comes to fruition, your faith is tested and you deal with fear and doubt and unbelief. Like last week when Pastor John Burgess dove off of a ladder, <laughs> you're dealing with fear and sometimes you have to trust God. You have to believe him that what he said will come to pass. Even this church at Future and Hope, as Pastor Wayne was just talking about, you're at halftime. You're halfway through Future and Hope. And it's so uniquely interesting to me that some of you are half at that halfway point in your life. And it's parallel on the halfway point in the church. And everyone stands at a decision place today. Are you going to keep pushing forward or are you not? Halftime is one of the most important times you ever face in your life. And in a football game, how many of you like football? Let me see your hand. You, you like football? Man, hands everywhere. How many of you don't give a rip about football? Let me, okay. At least you're on. Now, we're, now we can have a conversation. <laughs> Halftime in a football game is where, for those of you who like theater, it's intermission. And they run to the locker rooms and the coaches yell and holler, get fired up. Get up and act like you got a purpose in life and go out there and win this game and we can do it. And there's been some great halftime coach speeches. And what I would like to do is let's just go to the movies for a moment, look at the screen, and let's look at some of these cool halftime speeches from coaches. Great moments are born from great opportunity. And that's what you have here tonight. You shouldn't have any doubt in your mind about what you're supposed to do tonight and about how you're supposed to do it. 
you have shown yourselves just exactly who you are in here. It's about heart. It's about who can go out there and play the hardest. Who can go out there and play the smartest. This is your time. The time is now. Focus on the fundamentals. We've gone over time and time again. This is who we are. We're bigger, faster, stronger, more experienced. I'll ask you one last time. If you put your effort and concentration, we're going to be winners. You have to taste to win, want to win, and above all else, have the will to win. That's how winning is done. Let me hear it. That'll fire you up right there. Yeah. See, halftime is when you look at what well in the previous phase and look at what didn't go well in the previous phase and you make the necessary course corrections so that when you face the second half of your life, you face the second half of whatever it is you're in, your career, your finances, your education, whatever you're facing, you make those adjustments so you can win well. God is your halftime coach. And at halftime today, while you sit here, God sent me all the way from the mainland to, set, to tell you to look back at the word that he spoke over your life. Remember that what he promised you and know that it is still real. It's alive. Once again, it's not will he do it. It's when will he do it. Hold on. Don't give up. When you walk out those doors, get back on the field of life and win because God called you to be a winner. If you believe it, shout glory. I remember when I was uh, just a youth, I was raised in the church. How many of you were raised in church? Let me see. How many of you were church orphans? Let me see. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, when uh, I was just a young teenager, uh, I'm going to be very vulnerable to you for a minute, Okay. So don't laugh at me, because this is confessional. I was a young teenager, and my greatest concern in life, that this was the greatest, most perplexing concern to me, I was afraid that Jesus Christ would come back for his church and rapture us away before I had time to get old enough and get married. That was my concern. And I would pray about this concern, and I would say, God, that just wouldn't be fair. If you did that, be, because there's a lot of people that haven't been saved on the earth yet, and you need to reach them before you come back. And it has nothing to do with my personal ones, but I just wanted to get married. I don't know. It's just, it was in me. And one day I was at the church, and the pastor looked at me, and he said, God created Eve for Adam. He didn't create her to be just another, another option on Matchmaker or on Match.com. Or on Christian Mingle. Are you listening to me? <laughs> There's a lady sitting in this house today that the Holy Spirit is speaking to me and telling me to tell you that He didn't create you just to be another option. He created you with a purpose and with a destiny and God sent me here to stop you from settling for something less than what he has for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who you are, but there's a man in this room that is tempted to settle. And God is saying, don't settle. I created somebody for you. And when the pastor gave me that word, Man, I'm like, wow, God created a wife for me. She's somewhere on this planet. Man, I, I took it. I took that word. I embraced it. I took it home. I took it all the way to the bank. I'm driving home from church. I'm going, don't you worry about a thing. Oh. And I was looking at the cars pulling up beside me at the intersection. Maybe that's my wife right there. I don't know. 
And I was looking everywhere. And a day went by and nothing changed. And a week and a month and a year and another year. And I'm walking down the aisle of graduating high school and I don't even have a girlfriend. And I'm like, God, come on. I'm not the dork with the acne. What's wrong with me? You know, why, why, what's up? See, see, sometimes in life you face rejection. And there are people sitting in this room today that you have felt rejection in your life. But it wasn't rejection. It was God's protection. People were not rejecting you. God was protecting you from stepping into something that would have turned you away from the destiny that God had for you. Yeah. Stop letting the devil tell you that you're rejectable. Amen. You are protectable because yeah. that's how much God cares about you. Amen. My Lord, I feel the Spirit of the Lord yeah. talking to somebody right now. Yeah. And so I graduated high school, didn't even have a girlfriend. But I held on to my word and I went to college. I remember in my junior year of college, 16 couples were engaged to be married that I personally knew. And I didn't even have a girlfriend. I'm like, come on, God, that's, this is not funny anymore. And then I thought, you know, I think I'm going to help God out a little bit. <laughs> right? Some of you have been there. I can feel it. Just a wave of, I feel you, brother, came across the platform. <laughs> and so I started dating this girl. And I li this is confessional, okay? I'm going to say something. You're going to laugh. I know. But some of you have been there, and I'm going to say it because some of you are right there right now. I was dating this girl. She was a good, godly woman. We had a godly relationship. In fact, she was known as the prayer warrior on campus. And I was dating this girl, and I knew that she was not the destiny that God had for me. And I would literally pray every day, God, don't let me marry this girl. Please, God. <laughs> I like her, we're having a good time, but don't let me go too far down this road. I know it's not the path you have for me. Have you ever just done stuff that you knew had nothing to do with your destiny? God didn't ordain you to walk down that path and you're praying that God won't let you destroy your own life because you couldn't figure out how to get an exit strategy and get out of that bad job or get out of that bad relationship or get out of that bad career or get out of that bad financial situation. Have you ever been there before? Yeah. And so I got out of that relationship and, and I thought to myself, you know, they, 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 they say that, you know, the cerebral cortex is the decision-making part of the brain and it's not fully formed until you're 25. So when I hit 25, I'll start trying to make a decision about who I'm going to marry and maybe I'll get my act together. And then I remember driving down the bypass late at night. I was just cruising along and I realized, oh, I'm 25. I forgot I'm supposed to be married at or at least looking for a wife. I got to start looking for a wife. I got to get married. Like I'm just going to go find a lineup somewhere and pick somebody out and say, all right, it's time, you know. <laughs> and so I hit 30 years old. Nothing. Not even a perspective. Not even, not even potential in my life. And I'm going, now, Lord, you gave me a word. What in the world? Why, why is this not coming to pass? And I remember in 2006, I was a pastor on staff at a church and a little old godly lady came up to me. She was a saint of God, white-headed and just small and fragile. And, and she came up to me, and, and she had a gift. She had a gift of prophecy. And there's different people that have different gifts that the New Testament talks about. And you you got to know your gifting. you got to know what it is, and you got to stay in your lane and don't get out because you look like an idiot when you do. You know, <laughs> stay in your lane. That was free. That's a whole other sermon. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, I want to go down a rabbit trail so bad right now and I'm going to stay on. <laughs> so, so she walked up to me and, and when the Lord gave her a prophetic word, it was a unique delivery. She would always do it in a poem. I mean, she'd be standing there looking at you and then the Spirit of the Lord would come on her and she would give you the longest poem and it would be perfectly rhymed and it would be prophesying over you and God would just drop it in her spirit and you'd say, when did you write that? I didn't, God just gave it to me. She ended up publishing and releasing a full book of poems that the Lord had poured into her spirit. But one day she walks up to me after church and she hands me a piece of paper and on it is a poem. And I read it and I remember the last half. And it said, God has a wife for you and you will travel, she will travel with you as you preach the gospel. 
And so I looked at her, and one half of my brain is going, do you know how many years I've been hearing this stuff? <laughs> and the other half of me is going, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for another confirmation, because I was getting weary and well-doing, and I appreciate that. And so there's battle going on in my mind. And while I'm battling, she, you know, she's a little stooped over, and she looks up, and she goes, you know, I don't think it's going to happen real fast. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Here's your paperback, you know. And my, my feathers got ruffled. I didn't appreciate that. I said, I'm going to receive the word that she wrote down and not receive the word that she spoke. <laughs> don't we do that? We think God's a la carte, right? We can pick what we want and leave what we don't want. And so I literally said, you know, God does need help. I'm going to go find me a girl, and I'm going to prove her wrong, and I'm going to get married. And I went and found me a girl. And we started dating, and it was a train wreck. I mean, it wasn't a bad relationship. It was just deeper and deeper down a road, a good godly Christian woman, deeper and deeper down a road that I did not feel the presence of God going with me down that road. See, here's why. If you're filling in the blanks, you can't cash in on the promises of God in your own time. It has to be in His time. And can I tell you this? God don't need your help. You ain't got nothing to offer God. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it for me. And so that relationship was broke off. And I heard about there was a, a, a pastor of a mega church that was uh, holding a, a marriage conference not far away in another town. And I went to that convention center where the marriage conference was. I went with a pastor friend of mine. And uh, we're looking around because it was opened up to single people. And about 75% of the people were married. About 25% of them were single. And you could tell because there was a huddle of girls over here and a huddle of guys over here. And, and they didn't have wedding rings on. And, and everybody's there to hear, how, how do I get married? What's marriage like? Talk to me. And, and, and I looked at my pastor friend and I said, I'm going to find the prettiest girl in this building. I'm going to ask her out on a date. He's going, no, nah, you, you wouldn't do that. I said, why not? Think about it. If she's here, she's a Christian. And if she's at a marriage conference and she's single, she wants to get married. That's low-hanging fruit, brother. <laughs> it's harvest time. <laughs> so I went and found, somebody said glory. <laughs> You just need a good wingman. It's a pastor, and you'll be all right. <laughs> so I went and found this girl. I thought she was the prettiest girl in the room. I walked up to her, started talking to her, and I asked her out on a date. And she was so kind and turned me right down to my face. <laughs> I'm like, man, you've been asking God, and the answer's right here in front of you. I'm a good Christian man. Do you want to get married? I mean, but see, I turned around, tucked tail, and started walking out the door. And I'm walking up these big, massive concrete steps, and all of a sudden, you know, thousands of people around everywhere, and I hear somebody yelling, some girl yelling in the back, Jeff, Jeff, and I turn around, and there's this girl running up the steps, and she goes, don't leave, she changed her mind, she wants to go out with you. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus, glory. <laughs> and so I took her out, we went to a little Italian restaurant, and we had dinner, and then I was taking her to her car, and then I walked away, and I went to my car, and it was the dead of winter, freezing cold, and I remember sitting down in my driver's seat and I closed the door. It was so cold. But when I sat down in the seat, I just collapsed. I was exhausted. I, I literally didn't even have the energy to lift my hand up and put the key in the ignition and start it. I laid my head against the headrest and it just felt like I was melting into the seat. And for 20 minutes, I sat there in the cold just trying to get my strength back. And I couldn't figure out what was going on, but... Then I realized, and if you're filling out your notes, it will exhaust you. It will drain you to be in the presence of people who are not a part of your destiny. Mm. You've got to know that the people you are surrounded with, they have something to do with the word that God has in your life. Are you with me? 
So 10 years later, and I know, right? You like the stories long enough. I can't imagine living it. <laughs> 10 years after I got that word from the little old saint of God, I was, uh, I was dating a girl, a good godly woman, just involved in ministry, powerful ministry, and I'm thinking, you know, uh, got deeper into that relationship, and I'm realizing this, 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 isn't, uh, this isn't God. This, she's not the one for me, and she knew the same thing. And, but her pastor called me up. Their church was four hours away up in Knoxville, Tennessee, and he said, I'd like for you to come up and preach. I said, okay. So I drove four hours that Sunday morning, went to Knoxville, Tennessee. I walked up this huge set of steps up to the front of that church, and I opened that big door. And when I stepped inside, the very first person I saw was behind the information desk, the most beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed lady I had ever laid eyes on in my life. And I went, oh, dear God in heaven, I've been with Leah, and I just found Rachel. That's what I thought right there. And I went, what in the world am I supposed to do? I came here to preach and my whole world's just been rocked. So I did what anybody would do. I broke up with the girl I was with. And I Facebook messaged Rachel. I found out what her name was. I Facebook messaged her and I said, do you mind if I call you? She said, not at all. And there's not been one day since then that we have not talked. And in fact, of July 14th of this year, we stood by the lakeside with our pastor and looked each other in the eyes and promised to love and cherish each other for the rest of our life. It's my pleasure to introduce to you my Rachel, my promise, my word from God, my wife, Mrs. Melinda Shortridge. Will you stand? <laughs> Now, I drug you through that whole story to say this. For me, that was a relationship issue, but for some of you, it's something else. It's a career. It's a calling into ministry. It's to write a book. It's to do something great for God. It's to do something with your family. Maybe even start a family, adopt a child, get an education, whatever it is. You're at that halftime point where you have to make a decision. Am I going to hold on? Am I going to believe God for what he said? Or am I going to let go and settle? See, I got to say this to you before you go. It's so important you get this note. If you're taking notes, write this down. Delayed destiny does not mean destiny denied. Just because it takes a while to come around doesn't mean that it's passed you by. It's still coming. If you're, if you're taking notes, Satan has the power to interfere, to delay. I skipped over one. We'll come back to it. Satan has the power to interfere and to delay, but he does not have the ability or the authority to cancel out your promise. Are you getting that? So back up and I'll help you fill in the blanks right before that. We know that God has a plan for his people. And many times before that plan can be executed, there comes an interruption. There are things that will come into your life that, see, see I said, I'm going to pick out the prettiest girl in this building. See, I know it's Halloween time. <laughs> Woo, thank you, Lord. What's that? Is that on here? Okay, something under here. So, do you have a bomb squad that you can... <laughs> Just don't invite me next time. Don't... <laughs> Every time I show up, show up, I'm as surprised as you are that they actually had me back, but don't take me out on stage. <laughs> Where was I? I was trying to talk to you. That's all I was trying to do. Um, Halloween. Halloween. If, you, if you see one of these little guys running around with pointed ears and a pitchfork, and a that ain't the devil. And the devil don't come to you like that. He comes to you looking like everything that you've been hoping and dreaming for. 
But you have to know fool's gold when you see it. Amen. You have to understand what cubic zirconium is. you got to be able to know a real diamond when you see it. And I will tell you this, you don't have to work near as hard or long or pay near as much of a price for cubic zirconium as you do a diamond. I'll tell you that because there's one on her finger right now. <laughs> <laughs> What God has for you doesn't always come overnight because there's great value in it. There's great value in you. God has put something in you that is tremendously valuable. Don't settle. I've come here today to stop somebody from settling for something less than the promises that God has hung over your life. So I ask myself, what is it that causes people to settle? If you're filling out your notes, I'm going to move through this quickly because I'm out of time. Lack of confidence causes people to settle. Confidence in what? Confidence in yourself. You, know, you, you, you just don't believe that maybe you can receive what God promised. I'll tell you this, my wife, I didn't know this before I married her. I didn't know it until after we were married. She had a list of things that she had written out before the Lord that she said, and until the man that I meet, until I can check off every one of these things about him, I am not going to marry him. How, I mean, how many did you have on that list? 47 line items. 47, who does that? <laughs> if I would have known that, I would have, I would have not had the confidence to go out with her. I'd have been like, she's looking for somebody Mr. Perfect. What I didn't know was God took 47 years almost trying to get me whittled down because my desire and what I asked God for in, his, in a wife, I had put such a demand on the anointing that if he brought her to me without refining me, I would have never been able to handle her. Yeah. I would have never been able to accept the blessing. I would have destroyed it. Are you hearing me today? Yeah. Some of you had prayed such prayers and you've put such a demand on the anointing, on the anointing with such a great vision. You, not, you weren't ready for it the day after. David wasn't ready to be king the day after. I wasn't ready to get married at 14 years old. Are you hearing me? Can you say Glory. <laughs> But it doesn't mean that God has forgot you. Another reason people don't, uh, another, another reason people settle is lack of trust, lack of trust in God. Maybe he's not big enough to do what you want him to do, and maybe you need to help God out. The Lord help you. Number three, lack of vision. Lack of vision for the future. You, for, you forget those promises God put over your life. And number four is fear. Pastor John talked about it last week, climbing up a ladder trusting his two boys to catch him or not <laughs> fear of the unknown i mean you may not know what god has for you but uh you, you certainly know what you got now and uh, yeah okay so it doesn't match up to everything but uh at least you know how to handle what you got and, and if you let go of this something will come around the corner might not be as good so you just settle because you're afraid that what god has for you might not be as good as that whatever it is that you got stuck with Whatever it is that you can't let go of. I'm about to close. It was Sunday, February the 5th of this year, 2017. The Super Bowl 51 was hosted at the NRG Stadium in Houston, Texas. How many of you watch football? How many of you don't give a rip about football? <laughs> at least you're honest. Now we can talk. How many of you watched that game? Yeah, hands everywhere. Here it was, the New England Patriots and the Atlanta Falcons, and we're from Atlanta, praise God, are in the Super Bowl, and everybody's going, Falcons don't have a chance. Patriots are going to crush them. Game starts, first quarter. The entire first quarter, the Falcons kept stopping everything the Patriots would try to do. Falcons would stop them, stop it, and everybody's like, what in the world? This is crazy. How is this even possible? got Tom Brady up against a guy that's hardly been on the field. What in the world? And so they go into the second quarter and it goes downhill for the Patriots from there. Atlanta scores a touchdown and people are going, oh, how is this possible? Patriots have nothing. Atlanta scores another touchdown and another. They put 21 points on the board and the Patriots can't even get a point on the board. Finally, in the last two seconds of the first half, Patriots get a field goal. Three points on the board. <laughs> it's I'm sorry. 
21 to 3 and they go into halftime and, and they scatter to their locker rooms and they hear their speeches like we saw a little, little while ago. And then they flood back out on the field and people's like, maybe, just maybe there's a tiny hope for the Patriots. And they come out on the field and the Falcons score again. Bam, 28 to 3. The deficit is so bad, everybody knows that no time in history has a deficit like that ever been turned around from. Never. It's not possible. People started getting up and leaving the stands. At the Super Bowl, people around the country turning off their televisions. Lost that bet, you know going to bed, thinking it's over. But something happened. Something happened in the New England Patriots where somehow they believed that they were supposed to win that Super Bowl. Somehow they believed that that trophy was for them. And suddenly, bam, they made a touchdown. And then another touchdown. And 25 unanswered points went to the scoreboard to tie the game 28 to 28. The Patriots won the overtime coin toss, received the kickoff, and drove the ball 75 yards down the field to win with a two-yard touchdown. Won the Super Bowl against all odds, and not only did they win it, but when they finished, 30 Super Bowl records had either been matched or shattered by the New England Patriots. Why? Because one team refused to let themselves be beat down, even though... Every odd was against them. They knew that was their trophy, and they weren't stopping until it was done. In fact, if you will, why don't we go to the screens, and let's watch a couple highlights from that game right now. Woo! Yeah! Sometimes a game is not just a game. It's a gathering, a shared moment that unites us and resonates for the rest of our lives. Tonight, the Pats have returned. They have gone to the Atlanta Falcons who are seeking their first round in only their second Super Bowl appearance, their franchise's history. When that moment arrives, we each see it differently. Freeman, what a cut! Touchdown, Atlanta! And Atlanta has grabbed the lead in Super Bowl 51. Through our own lenses, through our own eyes, Let's go! We experience the emotion of proving we belong. Brady gets the snap from Andrews. Pass is picked. Intercepted Robert Alford. He's gone. There are no flags. And the Falcons add to their lead. Let's go! We feel the weight of history and expectations. It would be an unprecedented comeback if the Patriots climb out of this hole to win their fifth Super Bowl. Right now, it's Atlanta in charge. Share the pain of having nothing left to give. <laughs> now they'll throw. Pass is caught. That's White. Touchdown. And we're swept away by the joy of the impossible made real. Boy, you got to drop them to come back from a 25-point deficit when things are dire. But you put it on 12's back. They may have the regular season MVP. We might be looking at the Super Bowl 51 MVP if this Let's plays go, out. Matt. Let's go! Here's Edelman broken up in the pass. Edelman comes down with a football. They're saying it's a catch. This is a tie game. And as we capture it in our hearts, we make it our own. Tied at 28 after a rally that was next to impossible. Toss to White. He's in! Patriots win the Super Bowl! Brady has his fifth! What a comeback! That's when a game becomes a part of us. Now I'm done, but let me say this. Some of you are where the Patriots were at halftime. You have been at a place in your life where you have been beat down. You have been buffeted by the enemy. You have been pushed back until you feel like you can't be pushed back anymore. 
But today it's time for you to come out of the locker room with the fire of the Holy Ghost, with the anointing of God upon you, with the breath of God putting wind in your sails and get out those doors and go out there and do what God called you to do and go out those doors and receive the word that God has over you and not give up and not settle. In fact, I want to leave you with this verse. It's in Proverbs 24 and verse 16. Ready? Read. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. And let me translate that verse for you real fast. What that verse is saying is the only difference between a just man and woman and a wicked man and woman is the one that chooses to get back up when they're dropped down. That's it. A just man falls down seven times. I guarantee you the Patriots got pushed down a whole lot more than seven times in that first half. It was pretty funny to watch because I'm from Atlanta. But anyway, (laughs) they got back up. And for the purposes of this sermon, I'm going to be excited about it. They got up. They refused to be pushed down. And I'm challenging you today. You're at halftime. Don't fall down and stay down. Get up. This trophy's yours. This game is yours. You're on the winning team. May the Lord bless you.